This is Before It Was Headlines, It Was Prophecy. I'm your host, Katie Elizabeth. My, my book is in print now, The Threshold of Technocracy. Well, it's the second printing, actually. And it will be available through downloads, you know, through Kindle. On Kindle. How would you say that? And I'm hoping to be able to make it available for lending and um, for a limited time to offer it free. And I'll be checking into that the first of the week. And we'll be sure to announce that in the Goshen Gazette. But it is available now in print and at Kindle, or on Kindle. I want to go over just a couple of things. I think it's interesting that um, the reason for the second printing is, and it hasn't been changed, but it's so interesting to see how many things have taken place in the five years since it was written, five and a half years. And the momentum that has been gained, and so the things that have also been mentioned in this as the general direction that were mentioned in this book, it's, it would be, if that's gaining the same momentum, we need to be aware. We, we may not have the time, as we're all talking about being ready, we need to make sure we're actually implementing things that we are, you know, things that it takes to be ready. And I'm not talking in the natural, I'm not talking in the physical, I'm not talking financially. I'm talking about to spiritually be obediently ready, as the Messiah said. Because if we are obedient unto what Scripture says, then we will have the provision and the shelter and everything that Yehovah promises his people. Whatever that will entail and as the days unfold. We get to a couple of things, you know, of course, with more problems in the Middle East, you know, really in the forefront. I'm quite concerned, of course, so many are. But it does concern me that America is rushing headlong to be on the wrong side of prophecy. And that I find right. Because if we go into a civil war in Syria, and Syria is mentioned in scripture, prophetic scripture, what are we hedging our bets, saying, you know, we'll be on one side or the other, we'll still be included? That concerns me. Because I don't know enough about who's the good guy and who's the bad guy over there and everything I'm reading for us to be taking sides, for me as a believer. To be taking sides in this, I don't know. I don't have enough of the facts. But I do know we should not be involved in anything in another country based upon our own political differences and arguments in this country. That I do. So as the rider on the white horse who has been on conquering, I see that as it continues to unfold, whether it's politically or religiously, at this point, who doesn't come to mind? You know, we have every religion saying, I'm the right one. We have every political leaning saying, this is what we need. We have every financial solution saying, that's not the right one. And as all this continues to unfold, I've sadly seen a lot of that, even in even in groups that are um, claiming spiritual enlightenment, spiritual awareness, spiritual obedience to Torah. Even it's almost become a who's right and who's wrong, rather than aren't we supposed to be seeking our Creator on this? So that's something as we continually move towards a divide and conquer mentality on literally every level, every level. Now, of course, we know even, you know, no matter who's talking and who's in office, there's not going to be any peace. We know that. The rider on the red horse has been released. There will not be peace. The peace has been removed. And... I'd like to point out just a simple thought. You do realize, regardless of what the U.S. does decide to do in Syria, and by U.S., I'm talking Washington, D.C., because 
those of us who are um, citizens don't have the say. We just don't have it. So we do realize that regardless of what the U.S. does, there'll still be no peace. Americans can't agree on what would bring peace. We have no peace here just discussing it. We have to realize, whatever we do in Syria, there'll be no peace. Now, when we get to um, affordable, you know, the rider on the black horse, affordable what? Everything is costing more money. As we speak of the cost of things, it what is just becoming run-of-the-mill expenses are truly astronomical. If we really stopped and thought about what we're getting for our money, is that really what we want to be invested? And as these days are, are being very unstable, as our future is very uncertain, and I'm not saying the future of Messiah coming back. I'm saying the time between what we're doing now and when he comes back, that is uncertain. We don't know. Do we really want to be becoming, be investing in more dependence? Because it seems that that's what we're doing. We've moved so far away from any sort of created sustainability. And it just keeps costing us more and more. All, and, and those costs are not just financial. Those costs are in our stress, in our, in our well-being, in our health. Those are costing us. Which brings me to the, you know, the writer, the power horse, the writer and the power horse. Healthcare reform is actually going to contribute to the plagues and pestilence because as it becomes mandated, more and more people will find themselves stuck and trapped in less provisional health care than they already had. More expenses for the coverage, therefore people will have to work sick. They'll, they'll be the mandatory you know, checkups and that sort of thing. And so you'll have a waiting room full of people with problems. And then there'll be some that didn't have the problem until they got there and were exposed. I mean, there's just the simple, basic, common sense things that says this is going to escalate. And it isn't going to be less expensive because for every place that people will be um, will receive a voucher or be subsidized, that means it comes out of another. It will be coming from another source. And there's a lot of people who are getting their jobs scaled back, their hours scaled back, so the companies don't have to deal with the issue. So then they'll still be required to have it personal. If they don't put their faith, they just have a hey, and he's here. And I'm not even sure how that's going to turn out to be options as it all unfolds. I ain't prepared to pay the penalty. But, you know, really considering what the people, the men and women of God have paid in the past, a 2.5% not much of a price for me to have to pay to be able to take a stand and say, my God is my healer. Now, I can't claim to know who will lead the beastly government that is coming in you know, the new world order. I have no idea who the one individual, the personification of the most powerful Antichrist will be, but some American politicians really seem to be vying for that title. But I'm saying it looks like they want that job. It does look like they want to be supreme leader. So I want to talk for a few minutes about the High Holy Days. This is the month. And it's been really interesting. I've come to a what I consider a new revelation of information for my own life, for my own walk, and I share it with anyone who would like to know, but I'm not saying I have the absolute final answer on it either. American. Everybody's got their day that the new that is the new month. 
And I had literally sought for several years to, you know, for a while I was, I, I never got into the full moon at, as the beginning. But I have debated, you know, I've searched on the e-moon. And some say the sliver, some say, you know, some refer to it as a crescent, some say, and I, of course, it has to come out of Jerusalem. So I did what I felt like Yehava Hay was leading me to do. I went back to the beginning and I got into Genesis 1. And all of a sudden, it's like my light came on. The week of creation, I'm understanding that to be the first week, the first documented week. And in that first documented week, I'm understanding that to be the first documented month. And I believe as you read the first the first chapter of Genesis that we see that the, the trees, the fruit bearing plants were created mature, ready for harvest, which makes sense with the seventh month. Yeah, it's time for the apples and all of those things to be right because you have a made provision before he created what would need that. So I went back to the beginning of this feeling really sure that the next thing I realized was in understanding about this when is the new moon, when is the first of the month, I saw that the um, there was no moon until the fourth day. And we're told later in the Psalms and in later chapters of Scripture that, you know, the sun and the moon mark the seasons and the, and the days and the months. So those weren't here until the fourth day, which put me back to, wow, it was light and dark, day one. Night was dark. So for me, it suddenly made sense that the dark of the moon was the first of the month. So I, a few people have asked me, and I've said, the last waning sliver of the moon, when I see that, the next night is, the, you know, the next evening, because things begin in the evening, the next evening marks the first day of the month. That's how I'm observing it. And I ask you, hey, hey, it's like, I don't want to mislead anybody, so I qualify that. But then on top of that, this week I have noticed in, oh, and there's a ton of teachings, videos everywhere, YouTube, that between the night I observed Yom Teruah, the first day of the seventh month, and the rest of who, you know, the people that are talking about observing these, there has been a four-day time frame, a, a four-day window in which different people have elected a different day. So that's where I am. I have already celebrated Yom Teruah. And I'm basing that Yom Kippur will be the 10th day based on that date. And then Sukkot. So I'm not saying I have it all figured out, but with that four-day gap, I feel a little more confident to stand here and say that that's my understanding now. And I am still seeking. Changed my perspective entirely. But as we seek him and as we grow, in our knowledge. And it isn't about gaining knowledge, it's about knowing Him. So, as these days continue to unfold, be ready. The sure said He'd be back. This man of His Word. This is Katie Elizabeth, who works headlines, it was prophecy.